This program has been made possible by the generous support of these organizations at Stanford University. Office of the Provost, Institute for International Studies, School of Humanities and Sciences, and Ambassador and Mrs. L. W. Lane, Jr., Donald L. Lucas, the Russell Family Foundation, Ronald P. Spogley, International Environmental Politics was offered to students at Stanford University as part of the International Policy Studies Program during winter quarter 2001. So Ron has asked me to talk a little bit about sustainable development and in particular a project that I've been working on for the last three to four years which is land use change in China. But to bring it all together and to give you a little bit of an idea of what we're going to be talking about today, um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about definitions and assumptions that we have with the concept of sustainable development. What do we mean when people throw that around? Um, then speak specifically about some global environmental problems and how they fit into the concept of sustainable development. And then I'll speak specifically about some problems and in particular global climate change. And then within global climate change, how land cover and land use change fits into the picture. And then within land use and land cover change, I'll be talking about work that I'm doing in China. So this is just a little mental map of what we're going to be talking about today. Can you all see this? So I'd like to start off with just some definitions of sustainable development. And I don't know what your all backgrounds are and uh, whether You've already gone through this in other classes, but I think it's kind of helpful so that we have kind of starting off with the same, um, on the same foot. Sustainable development, well, first of all, just to bre break that down a little bit, what is sustainable? You know, we can look in the Webster's Dictionary and see, hey, okay, sustainable means X, Y, and Z, but I'd be curious to know what your impressions are of what sustainable means in this context. Does anyone? I like to teach Socratically, so since I don't know your names, I'm just gonna either pick you out by number, color shirts. Does anyone have an idea, when someone says sustainable development, automatically you have an idea or you have a concept of what that means, but if you were to break that down, what does sustainable mean? Yeah, women in blue. <laughs> Megan. Megan. It's uh, something that can be maintained in its current state of productivity or cleanliness or any of the above. For over a period of time. Okay, so you're saying that it can be maintained. Does that imply that there's um, some type of growth associated with it, or that it's the same over time? Really, we grow, but mostly we hold out for the status quo. Okay, it's interesting that you just said status quo. Um, so Megan says that sustainable means something that's m maintained, you can keep on doing it, and, and it maintains the status quo. Yeah, woman in orange. Sarah. Sarah. When you throw development in there, though, I think that, that you're automatically adding the growth. Okay, like, so... If you talk about sustainable development, you're saying, okay, to grow and develop while still maintaining some, some sort of element that you want to cre create, like... No, okay, so you're saying sustainable equals, development equals growth. That's what you're saying. Um, well, I'm just, I was just sort of adding growth to sustainability. Yeah, sort of. Okay, let's step back a bit. No, no, that's really good. Let's step back a bit and, and again, try to break up this concept of sustainability. What is sustainable? You know, we think of, 
I don't know if you have allowances or if you all work, but let's say you work at, I don't know where people work now, The Gap, and you make $100 this month, and you know you're not gonna work at The Gap next year because you're all graduating and uh, you're gonna travel to Tibet, but you've only got this $100 this month. How are you gonna sustainably use your $100? Are you going to go and have you know, spend a little bit at a time between now and your trip to Tibet? Are you gonna blow it all on a really nice outfit from the Gap and you'll have nothing to spend in Tibet? There's this concept of cost versus benefits, right? When you think about sustainability that, in other words, there are benefits that you can have today. You can spend your $100 from the Gap, but then there's the cost of when you're in Tibet, you're not gonna be able to buy any yak milk or yak milk as they call it here. So there's the cost of not spending in the future because you've already benefited today. So there's this tension, this trade-off between what you can use today versus tomorrow. Now, if you were to continue working, let's say you go to Tibet and you start a Gap store there, you're going to get some kind of benefit in the future. You're going to get monetary rewards. And in essence, you can maybe still get benefits in the future and the costs will be less. But nonetheless, that's assuming that you're going to still get some monetary rewards in the future. You're going to make $100 or you're going to make $200. But if we think of today versus tomorrow, if you want to spend $100 today versus spending it, investing it in mutual funds or waiting to spend it on your trip overseas, you have to weigh the cost and benefits of of your happiness or what you can buy with that money. But when we think about development in the broader perspective, clearly there's this larger trade-off that's not necessarily just monetary. It's not just what you can enjoy today versus what you can enjoy tomorrow, what you can buy today versus what you can buy tomorrow. So oftentimes when we think about this concept of sustainable, there's this concept of discounting. Do folks know what discounting is here? Okay, so I'm not gonna describe what discounting is. So sustainable, oftentimes when people talk about sustainability, there's this inherent cost-benefit analysis of, well, what's, what we can um, purchase today, we can't purchase tomorrow unless we have some revenue in the future. Now, when we think about development, though, there's, as Sarah said, development may equal growth. Now, I'm wondering whether there is an inherent dichotomy here that if we say development equals growth and not the status quo, like what Megan said, it's not the status quo, uh, we're improving ourselves, we're uh, learning, we're um, getting better all the time. Development at some level we think of equals progress, that there's some improvement. The question is then, can improvement be sustainable? It's not necessarily, that it cannot be, but it's something that we really have to think about when, when we throw this term around. And oftentimes, it is, it is um, a dichotomy that when you stop and think of the definition, well, maybe sustainable and development don't really go hand in hand. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe we're thinking of different terms, not necessarily sustainability and not necessarily development. There are some assumptions that we make also regarding sustainability that there's some development that's good and there's some development that's bad. And regardless of whether we put these values on it, um, you know, we see it in the media, we see it in the press, and certainly scientists talk about it all the time. We group countries uh, based on whether they're developing or developed. And there's this inherent assumption that if they're developing, well, where, they're, where are they developing to? You know, if you're from China, and people clearly think of China as a developing country, well, what's, what's, the, what's the level that they're hoping to develop to? Where are they, where are they improving to? What, stat, what is the status quo? Is the status quo Western style, American style, European style? You know, how, do we, how do we separate the developed versus the developing? And I don't have the answer to this, but I just wanted to throw this out at you as we talk about land use change and some of these global environmental problems that we all bring to the analysis our own assumptions and our own biases about what is good development and what is bad development.
when we talk specifically about global environmental problems and we get, then throw in, throw in this word sustainable development and global environmental problems, we have some assumptions. And the first assumption is that the problems are not sustainable. So if we go back to the definition of sustainable, well, we can't maintain having these problems and still have an economy that grows. And so we assume that problems are not sustainable and that the problems hamper development. If we continue having these problems, the economy's not gonna grow, and somehow we're going to not improve ourselves, we're not gonna improve the economy, we're not gonna improve our standards of living. How many times have you heard the phrase, um, this generation is living, has a better lifestyle, a better, living, better standards of living than the last generation? I mean, you hear things like that. Not necessarily all the time, but you know, some of the time. You hear, you know, this generation is better than last generation, or you know, when back in my day, I had to do this. And there's this, this comparison that you're living better off than your parents did and than your grandparents did. But if what if you were to, let's say, um, you decide that you're not going to buy a car because you think it's bad for the environment, or let's say you just don't want to drive, and let's say you um, don't have a computer, and you still use the typewriter. Would we consider those things development? Would, would, would folks say, oh, you're, still, you're living off, you're, living better, you're, you're better off than your parents if you were not using these technological advances? So again, I wanna just kind of make you all think that we have these assumptions of what is development, that certain things are better than others. The computer is better than the typewriter. A car is better than a bike. And so 1.3 billion people in China riding their bikes, is they're, they're developing to a status like Americans where everyone can drive. Um, but with these major, major global environmental problems, we think it, it could be that these problems hamper our ability to actually uh, develop. The question then is, how do we know what these problems are? Um, how do we know they exist? And how do we know what the causes are? My understanding of this class is Ron talks a lot about international environmental treaties and how international groups come to decision making on, on environmental problems. Well, I'm on the end, other end of that and I'm not dealing with the international policies. I'm using science on the ground trying to understand how we know some of these problems exist and what are the sources of the problems. So now you've been in this class for almost a quarter. Um, what would you say are some of the major environmental problems of today? I'm, I'm not gonna pick on Sarah and Megan just because I know their names. Climate change, all right, that's a big one. Climate change. Fisheries. Fisheries, de depletion. Sorry? Agricultural resource decline. Agricultural resource decline. Agriculture soil resources. Oh, okay. Soil degradation. Um, there is climate change. Deforestation. Deforestation. Air pollution. Air pollution. Air pollution. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have on here. Just some global environmental problems, and clearly you, we can sit around and just list all of them and get very depressed. Um, and I have down acid deposition, also known as acid rain, loss of biodiversity, which is associated with depletion of resources, both in the fisheries, agriculture, and deforestation. Of course, global climate change, deforestation, ozone depletion, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, what I like to do is take just climate change and talk a little bit about how we know that climate change is really happening. All right, so this, some of you already may know a lot of this, but just for our friends, um, we know greenhouse gases are the major source of climate change. And we know that within greenhouse gases, we've got carbon dioxide, methane, CFCs, and nitrous oxide. Okay, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because I assume that many of you have heard this before. 
What are the sources of carbon dioxide? Well, we've got fossil fuels, which Americans love. Land use, which I'll talk about in a moment. Sources of methane, land use as well. CFCs, we've got aerosols and refrigerants. We like to keep our ice cold, beers cold, all of that. Nitrous oxide, largely emitted through agriculture and fossil fuels. If we take this one step lower, one step down, and then try to look at the causes of these secondary and tertiary causes of climate change, we see fossil fuels are clearly emitted by use of coal, oil, natural gas. And then we can have another flow chart down here of what uses coal, gas, and um, oil. Land use is affected by deforestation, slash and burn agriculture. Methane is affected by li livestock, wetlands, rice paddies all emit methane. Nitrous oxide is agriculture, again, livestock and fertilizer releases a lot of nitrous oxides. And then our friends, again, fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. And so the main reason why I put this diagram up here is just to, for us to get a sense of the problem and how big of a problem it could be once we start thinking of with what kind of treaty we want to develop. Um, you know, if you talk about greenhouse gas treaties, um, and are you going to try to monitor all four of these? Are you going to monitor just carbon dioxide? And if you just monitor carbon dioxide, are you going to look at land use only? Are you going to measure just fossil fuels? And then if we look within each of these industries, are we going to look at um, gas consumption for cars? Are we going to look at only the Amazon uh, livestock? Are we going to look at mainly beef consumption? I mean, the list goes on and on of how detailed we can get. Um, and what I'm going to present today is some research I've been doing in land, uh, on land use change in southern China. And so I hope that this diagram, you know, when you get maybe lost in some of the details, you can get, come back to this diagram and think, well, this is how this particular type of research fits into the bigger picture of global environmental problems. So to focus a little bit more on climate change, how do we know that climate change is a problem? Uh, we, we all talk about it. Um, George W. Bush talked about it in, in the debates. Climate change, how do we know that it's actually a problem? Well, one of the first indicators is that the global mean surface temperature has increased by about 0.6 centigrade in the last 100 years. Since 1861, the 90s has been the, the warmest decade in over 100 years. And the warmest year in over 140 years is 1998. Now, it could be 1999. It may be even be the year 2000. But scientists don't have data, haven't analyzed the data up to the year 2000. So in other words, it's very likely that it, the, the, the trend is that surface temperatures are getting warmer um, than ever before. There have been increases in temperature in the northern hemisphere during the 20th century that is largest than any change during the last 100 years. And between 1950 and 1998, the mean nighttime daily minimum air temperature, I know that's a big phrase, the, just think, the minimum nighttime air temperature, so the coldness it gets at night, has increased by about 0.2 degrees cent, uh, Celsius per decade. That's about twice the rate of increase in daytime daily maximum air temperature. So you can think of it as the, the variation in temperature over time has actually decreased, declined, in that the amount, the, the minimum temperature has increased. The, minim, the, the coldest it ever gets has actually become warmer. Temperatures have also risen in the lowest eight kilometers of the atmosphere during the last four decades. And since the 1950s, 
and these are observations from weather balloons, the overall global temperature has increased by about 0.1 degrees centigrade per decade. Here I have some observations that were published just this past February in the IPCC report. And in this top graph, the red bars, the red bars indicate data from thermometers. And this is the, the, the mean variation, the, the mean temperature. And you can see that during the last 20 years, temperatures really departed from the mean. And if we use ice cores and tree rings, this is the data in blue, going back a thousand years, we can see the last 100 years is really different from the mean. And we're, we're really screwing things up, in other words, in the last 100 years. And we can see this through scientific data in tree rings and um, ice cores. Other evidence of global climate change Snow cover and ice extent have decreased. There's been widespread retreat of glaciers over the last 20th century, or during the 20th century. Did folks read this article in the New York Times on Monday? Absolutely depressing. If you haven't been to Kilimanjaro, I say you go there as soon as you graduate. It is one of the most amazing sites you'll ever see. Um, I went there after I finished my PhD, and thank God I went there because apparently, according to this article, it's gonna, the, the snow on top of Kilimanjaro is going to be gone in the next 15 years. <laughs> Shocking. I mean, it's been there for thousands of years. You know, snows on Kilimanjaro, Ernest Hemingway, you know, Ernest Hemingway's books, no one's going to know what he's talking about in 100 years. Um, The retreat of glaciers is, you know, we talk about it, we talk about uh, snow cap on top of Kilimanjaro, but it's really not a trivial thing. Um, if, you keep with, if you keep up with the newspapers and read about um, ice melt in Antarctica, it's really dramatic. And if we were to show a graph of the amount of ice that's, or glaciers that's actually been melting in the last 50 years, it, it, it's actually quite shocking. This is something that affects fisheries. Global average sea level and sea surface temperatures have risen. The tidal gauge data show that sea levels have risen 0.1 to 0.2 meters during the 20th century. Global ocean heat content has increased during the 1950s. And then there are other important aspects of climate. There's been an increase in precipitation in the northern hemisphere, increases in the frequency of extremely high temperature, what people called weird weather, decreases in the frequency of extremely low temperature, increases in severe droughts, severe wetness, again, just this, what people called really bizarre weather. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard about El Nino or La Nina, and scientists have attributed or tr have been trying to attribute it to climate change, that it's, it's more severe because of climate change. So what are the causes of climate change? Okay, we talked about global cli uh, um, carbon dioxide and all of that. Have you all seen the Mauna Loa curve? Okay, some of, some of you nod, some of you shake your head. Um, this is an instrument in Hawaii on top of Mauna Loa that measures carbon dioxide emissions. And in red are monthly measurements, and in black is the annual measurement, measured since 1958. And we can see that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased steadily since then. Does anyone know what these fluctuations, monthly fluctuations, mean, or what they're attributed to? Is anyone here from the Northeast? Well, I thought they were seasonal fluctuations. Okay. Um, so, like in the winter, carbon dioxide levels are going to rise because leaves have fallen off trees and are decomposing. And in the summer, there's a lot of CO2 being taken out of the yep. atmosphere by photosynthesis. So. Yep, that's absolutely it. Did everyone hear that? Yep. Seasonal effects because respiration of um, 
vegetation absorbing carbon dioxide during the summer and springtime. So this is actually interesting in that we can see, in essence, the effect of deforestation or what the effect of deforestation could be on CO2 emissions or the ability of vegetation to absorb carbon dioxide. So going back to my chart, so we know that a, a, a variety of, there are a variety of causes of global climate change and now we're going to talk specifically about land use and agriculture. Some of this may seem pretty straightforward. Um, land use change and urbanization. Land use changes the conversion of natural vegetation and agriculture doesn't necessarily have to be uh, natural vegetation or agriculture, but I'm particularly interested in urbanization and the loss of vegetation and um, natural ecosystems. One of the effects of land use change is that it segments natural corridors. And for those of you who are ecologists and biologists, you know that we need natural corridors for, for dispersal of organisms. You can think of, um, essentially a big road going down the Amazon, little, uh, any animal trying to cross the big road is going to get smashed by a logging truck. You know, that's probably uh, one thing to think about um, as far as these natural corridors are concerned. With urbanization and development, there's usually an increase in the demand for energy and roads and cars. You know, think of uh, New York City versus someplace in middle Iowa. You know, clearly, New York City is going to demand many more resources to sustain itself than Iowa. And part of that is population, indeed. But then there's also the lifestyles that people have when they live in the city. Oftentimes, they're um, using, using technology that's more energy intensive, or they, they engage in activities that are much more energy intensive, whether it's riding, riding the subway, versus um, riding a bicycle, or whether it's um, going to a play late at night. You know, you've got to light things up. You've got to light up the, uh, the, the, the theater. Has anyone heard of this concept of urban heat islands? Essentially, urban areas have their own microclimate. And the re one of the main reasons for this is that asphalts, as they replace natural vegetation, there's no place for rain to get absorbed, right? And you know, if you go to the beach, there's usually, well, on, on a warm day, if you go to the beach, there's a lot of reflectance. You, know, you have to wear glasses. Or when you go skiing, you have to wear glasses because the snow has very high albedo, has very high rate of reflectance. And so urban areas generally don't have as much vegetation and so the energy isn't absorbed in these urban areas. They're just reflected off. And so urban areas generally create their own microclimate. And taken as a whole, if we had lots of urban areas compared to rural areas, you would see that there's quite a differentiation in nighttime temperatures and even daytime temperatures between rural areas and very densely populated um, urban areas. One of the side effects of urbanization is an increase in the intensification of agriculture. And I think Megan had mentioned this earlier before, that with development, oftentimes we, well, one, one of the links with development is that as people get richer, there's this association that people get richer and oftentimes they eat more meat. Meat consumption increases with development. Now, in this country, there are a number, and particularly in California, there are a number of people who are vegetarians by choice, and um, there's a, certainly a lifestyle choice in being vegetarians. But in most developing countries, if you can afford meat, it's it's quite a luxury. And in China, um, as people get richer, they generally consume more beef. Now. 
meat production clearly is more intensive than growing corn because you have to grow the corn and then feed the cows. And then you also have to have land for the cows to live in. And so um, it puts a lot of stress on more traditional types of agriculture and even non-traditional agriculture. Essentially, if you're using the grain to feed cows or chickens, then you have to grow more grain, not only for yourself, but, but for the cows as well. So there's this relation between income and meat consumption, and clearly that cities are not self-sufficient. So now I'm going to talk specifically about land use change in China. And now I'd really like to know what all of your preconceived ideas are about what's happening in China. Someone other than Megan and Sarah and the woman with a very attractive skirt. That's me. <laughs> When, when someone says development in China, what comes to your mind? Yes? Just maybe like increases in population and how population is putting pressure on different, um, different areas of the land. And, uh, so one of the first things you think about is population. Okay, what is your name? Hanky. Hanky. Hanky, okay. Anyone else? Population? Yes. Maybe um, movement from more rural areas to cities and urban areas. Oh, okay. You think of migration. different sort of demand moving from different types of agricultural use because of Western technology, etc. And like the difference in what people want, or I mean, bring it down sort of really basic level, but sort of, you know, instead of having, you know, regular Chinese food, you want a hamburger or something like Western. Okay. McDonald's. What are your names? Ashley. Ashley. Okay. Emily. Okay. Emily. All right. Kate. Kate. Okay. Mm -hmm. We haven't heard from Kate. Mm -hmm. What do you think of when, when <coughs> someone says development in China? Um. What, what? Or not even the development. When someone says, "Oh, I'm going to go to China," what do you think of? I think of really crowded cities. A uh, really dense area. You think of de high density areas. And you said cities, so your image is often of cities, not of rural areas? Yeah. Anything else? Has anyone been to China here? Has anyone here been to a developing country? I always like to put that in quotations. Being from a developing country myself. Yes, Megan, where have you been? North Africa. North Africa, okay. A little different. Very different from the United States. Yes, and I went there from Italy too, so it was like parts of Italy can be considered the, developing. Well, yeah, country. the U.S. is like first, and then I guess Italy is considered second, and North Africa is almost considered third, bordering on second. So it was an interesting progression. Any other experiences when you think of developing in China? Oh, sorry. Go oh no, go ahead. You were thinking of where you've been. Yeah, fun ones too, like Poly Polynesia. Oh, okay. Yeah. So island nations. Yeah. Mexico. I've been to little towns in Mexico. And okay. There's a big difference in the style of living. So, if you were to pull your experiences in these other places, and and think about China, how how do you think they're different, the same? Again, I, I just want to kind of probe you for your impressions of China before I kind of dive right in, give you my impressions of China. Well, no, one, no one's men mentioned the word poverty. Do we? I mean, is that kind of well, uh, implicit? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, I, I don't know. I, when I think of China, I think of more industry than I think of like Mexico as far as like developing, you know? I still think I I still feel like there there's industry. I mean, like every there's so many things that are made in China. I mean, there's there's a big you know development process already kind of going 
and I don't see in my mind as much like people on the streets begging, you know, okay. than, yeah, maybe. than I think of India or something. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking maybe it has to do with sort of the industry side of it, but it's still like, I mean, when I think of poverty, I think my, much more of India or like even South Africa or something okay. where it's like you have townships or like centers. Oh, that's interesting. This is very interesting for me to hear. Okay, so, so you don't think of poverty as much. You think of that they're already developing. Um, I mean, you know that there is some there, but it's just not, maybe not as right. intense. Or, like they have some but maybe they're not being paid as much as they should be or something like that. Like I could see, you know, sweatshops kind of, like, you know, I can imagine all, I can imagine that, but I imagine less like people on the streets begging kind of thing. Okay, okay. So they're developing, but they don't, they're not making as much money as we are here in the U.S. Were you going to say something? Well, just well? the same thing. Like, I think of, of like, big factories and sweatshops. Right. People are working long hours, not necessarily working much. Okay. Any other thoughts on China? So, so poverty is there, but it's not the same kind of poverty that you think of as far as Mexico or... In, what was the other? India. India. Or India. Everyone keeps talking about India, okay? That's interesting. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Coal burning. You think of it as being coal burning. Yeah. So you like, think of the air as being really dirty. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you a picture later that's, that you're going to love. So you think of coal burning. Wait, who said that? Yeah, you said that. I don't know. I think it's more it as more technologically advanced than some other developing countries. Huh? At least on top. Like maybe people don't have access to it. But. Okay, so they're they're poor, but not they're not as poor as India. They're developing. They have access to hamburgers and McDonald's, which we know is good in a way. Um, I, I'm, I'm saying that as a the irony. So, um, they they are working in coal-burning factories. Um, they're living in very densely populated cities. And someone mentioned there, there's a lot of migration from rural to urban areas. All right. Any other? Are, are, they, are they riding their bikes? Are they driving a car? You're thinking rice paddies. Agriculture, yeah. There's a lot of people in the rural areas. Yeah. Okay, so there's rice paddies, and some, uh, there are people living in rural areas. All right, I'm just going to, we're going to get back to this later on. All right. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the situation right now, and then we can kind of go back and see how um, most of these are actually true which is interesting since none of you have been to China. Um, there is rapid economic development. Absolutely, it's um, it really impressive. Between 1978 and 1996, annual GDP grew between 9 and 13%. That's adjusted for inflation. Now, for those of you who don't keep track of the Wall Street Journal and may not know what, what the normal rate of growth is, the US economy is growing at 2 to 3%. And if our economy were growing at 9 to 13%, I think probably everybody would be you know, investing all their money in, in, in the stock market. Um, people would be jumping up and down. So you know, the economy is growing really fast. And why is the economy growing so fast? Largely industry. Um, largely because they are using lots of fossil fuels to fuel development, um, to fuel these factories. One of the effects of economic development is that it has raised per capita income. Most Chinese now live better than they did even five years ago. So we don't have to compare cross-generation. We can compare even within one generation. And the changes in income have led to rapid changes in dietary standards. So what we've seen now is as a result of this really fast-growing economy, there has been rapid urbanization. So here's the rural to urban. There have been massive migrations. And there's been 
a, a pretty big change from a grain-based economy or grain-based diet to a meat-based diet. Um, and all of these have pretty big implications for land use. So it's, it's quite curious to hear your impressions and to, to see that they're actually, a lot of your impressions are right and to see where, where some of these changes are coming from, what's really causing some of these changes. So what, I'm interest, what I have been interested in doing and what I have been doing is looking at how land is changing in, bless you, in southern China, in the Guangdong province. The area that I'm looking at is, this is China. The area that I'm looking at is the Pearl River Delta that's in southern China. And uh, we can think of Taiwan is over here somewhere, uh, and Hong Kong is just about there. So it's the province that's, this is the province here, it's the province closest to Hong Kong. So I've been looking at land use change just in the Pearl River Delta of this particular province. And I've been looking at this particular area for a number of different reasons. One is that between 1988 and 1996, real GDP grew between 350 and 550%. It's a very short amount of time for a lot of development. The area is a major agricultural region. It's a national producer in rice, paddy rice, rice um, lychees. Do folks know what lychees are? Oh, okay. Folks in the Northeast often don't know what lychees are. Um, bananas, pond fish, and sugarcane. So urbanization in this area is going to have massive implications for the rest of China if it produces a large amount of the lychees and, and fruits and vegetables um, for the entire country. The Pearl River Delta is also really interesting because it houses a number of special economic zones. And these are areas that the, the central government in Beijing has called them economic laboratories. And I'm sure that most of you know that China is a socialist communist country and uh, it doesn't really work on a market economy, but that's really changing. And in these special economic zones, the central government has essentially used these areas um, as real life laboratories to test market, market forces, market economy. So rather than allowing uh, central planners to dictate, well, you're going to grow 40 tons of rice, they actually let the farmers decide how much rice they're going to grow. They, they let the um, factory managers decide how much output to produce. So it's pretty different in terms of the rest of China. The Pearl River Delta is also really special in terms of its uh, geographic proximity to Hong Kong and its cultural ties to overseas Chinese investors. How many of you here eat Chinese food or have gone out? Okay, I'm gonna, most, all of you, okay. Now I'm gonna ask you a harder question. What kind of Chinese food do you generally eat when you go out? Vegetarian, okay. Um, I'm Vegetarian, how about the style? Do you usually know what style you eat? Cantonese, Mandarin, Sichuan, Hunan, Hunan? Hunan's too spicy for me. Sorry? Hunan's too spicy. Hunan is very spicy. Part of the reason why, does anyone know why um, Hunan food, is, well, the history of Hunan food being spicy or Sichuan food, or the history of spicy foods? It's an extremely warm area where food tends to go bad very quickly. Yep, and, and it's a, a lot of really hot spices act as preservatives food. Yep, and it's, it's a way to cure, yeah, yeah. it's a way to kind of cure food. So it's kind of interesting for you to think about next time when you eat spicy foods. This is bad, but I don't know it. Um, Cantonese food is, is, I ask because Cantonese food is probably the most prevalent Chinese food most of you have eaten. Sweet and sour pork, um, what else? Mushu pork, I can't even think of the English names for them now. Um, beef broccoli, uh, chow mein, um, all, a lot of these things that you eat at, at, at restaurants here are Cantonese food. They're from southern China. Um, and, uh, and the main reason for that is most of the immigrants from China in this country are from that region, or they're from Hong Kong. And that's the style of food that you get. Um, so in this particular area, 
there is quite a connection to overseas Chinese investors. And that's pretty important in stimulating a lot of this industrial development. So what I'm going to show now is a satellite image of the area that I'm talking about. And one of the exciting things about satellite remote sensing is that it offers a, a synoptic view of the landscape. And you know, traditionally, people have done surveys on the ground, which is very important. But you can't survey all of China. You can't survey all of North America. Um, you can. It just takes a lot of staff power to do it. Um, and so satellite remote sensing get, provides this kind of bird's eye view snapshot of what's going on in the landscape. So this image here is a this image here is of my study area, the Pearl River Delta. Here is the island of Hong Kong. This is the delta itself. The areas in red are vegetation. Anything that's green reflects red in the near-infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Probably more information than you want to know. But um, essentially, everything that's red is some type of leafy green vegetation. Areas in white, remember what I talked about earlier? Urbanization has very high reflectance values when you go skiing, very reflective. Uh, areas in white are areas with very high reflectance, very high albedo. And most of these areas are brand new, just recently plowed land. Not paved, but plowed. So you think of soils as being very bright and being very, very reflective. This area here is the brand new airport in Hong Kong. And these darker blue areas, these are the urban centers. So here's Guangzhou. This is the capital of the, of the province. And this is Shenzhen. This is one of the special economic zones. And these areas here, these kind of lighter purpley blue areas, those are largely rice paddies, rice paddies and fish ponds. So what I'm going to show you are some analyses that I've, I've done looking at land use change in this area, this area, and this area right here. I'm going to try to turn this light off so you may see it a little better. So this is a satellite image that was taken in December of 1988. And these kind of gray areas are rice paddies. These blue purple areas are uh, fish ponds. This is the river. Uh, red areas largely field crops and other types of vegetation. And here's the old city center. And you can see that even back in 1988, there was quite a lot of development. And city was expanding to the northeast. By 1996, you can now see huge roads going through pretty much all of what was rural areas. The city boundaries now have grown to most of this part of the image. You know, if you compare some of these areas before, um, and in fact, if you look down here, you can see this is the, the land use change map. The pink areas are areas of agriculture that didn't change between 1980 and 1996. The green areas are stable urban land. These are urban, these were areas that were urban even back in 1988. And then everything in yellow changed from agriculture to urban. 
And everything in orange was converted from natural vegetation to urban. So in, in, in total, all of these yellow and, herb, uh, yellow and orange areas are brand new urban lands. Okay. This is just in one part of the Pearl River Delta. This is the area of Shenzhen. And we can see, again, in 1988, you can barely see a road being built. Just barely. Like a little bit of a pattern there. And um, again, these white areas are, are just cleared land. So these are d developers have gone into the area and said they want to develop a particular parcel of land. The first thing they need to do is clear out what they used to have there. And in the Amazon, they often do this using slash and burn techniques, um, which is not common here because it's, we're not talking about the rainforest. These were largely shrubs. Um, and evergreen forests. And then again in 1996, we can see this kind of explosion of urbanization. So earlier when I gave you the numbers of the rate of economic development, you can see this is what's really driving the economic growth, is land use change. And again, down here you can see the land use change map between the two years, all of these orange areas used to be natural vegetation and now is urban. Now this is interesting. The, the government recognizes that as people get richer in China, they want to eat more meat. They are um, wanting to live in single story buildings just like in the United States and elsewhere. And they no longer want to live communally and um, Essentially, everyone wants their own little dwelling. That means there's quite a lot of pressure on agriculture, and agricultural land is being lost at an extremely high rate. And so in the 80s, the government and the World Bank teamed up together to reclaim part of the delta for agriculture development. So this is a 1988. This is going down into the delta. So this is the delta right here. And this is agriculture <clears throat> with um, money, funds from the World Bank and the central government. By 1996, they expanded areas of agriculture well into the delta. And you think of the human and capital that's human cost and capital that's required to reclaim the delta for agriculture for agricultural development is huge. It's absolutely huge. But at the same time, it's something that needs to be done because agriculture land is being lost to a lot of urbanization, as we can see here. I mean, this area is largely um, urbanization of natural vegetation. But here, we can see most of the land lost is from agriculture. So what I like to do now is take you to the ground from the satellite images and show you what this land use change really looks like on the ground. So here we've got farmers um, planting rice. I don't know if you can see this. This is a pretty ingenious way of using a ladder actually. Um, I don't know if you can see that this is actually a ladder. All of these houses are brand new. This is, this is what development means to a lot of Chinese farmers, not necessarily having, um, it, it's not necessarily a fancy house, but it's certainly fancier than what they used to live in. And these are all brand new as well, um, these brick houses here. When most people think of China, and I think some people had mentioned agriculture, um, when most people think of China, this is their image of the farmer out in the field working on, um, working on growing crops. But increasingly, 
China is looking, parts of China is looking like this. And you can't really see this that well in this picture. But do you see these poles? Folks, see those poles? Do you, do you know what they are? Power lines. Yeah, they're power lines. But these stumps, it's a shame you can't really see this that well. Does anyone have any idea what those stumps are? They didn't build them. Trash yeah. Termite mounds. Uh, no, no. In Africa, they would be termite mounds. <laughs> well, here you can see the topography a little bit. What we're looking at is the side of a mountain. And urbanization and development requires a lot of raw materials. And so when you're living next to a mountain, what better source of raw materials than the mountain? So um, throughout southern China, you see these lumps, these kind of, I, I like that description, Sarah, termite mounds. Um, but they're huge. I mean, these are like 20, 30 feet. And essentially, they've excavated all the land in between. So you can envision this used to look like this. It was this hill. And uh, they've excavated all the area in between for raw materials to build roads and houses. Um, so when we talk about land use change, it's not just the conversion of agriculture to urban areas or um, just the urbanization of natural f vegetation like forests. Um, but this is, this is development as well. Uh, people using uh, raw materials to better their livelihood. But I would bet that most people would say this is not development or that this is bad development. And increasingly, the image of China that people should have is of this rather than the farmer. Um, I think this is prettier than most roads you see in the US other than maybe Palm Drive. Um, but it seems like they're trying to emulate Palm Drive. This is this really fancy road. It's a three-lane highway on either side with very fancy um, street lights. And we've got palm trees. You know, this, it's quite aesthetically pleasing. And this is in a country where not everyone has access to electricity. Not everyone has, in fact, most of the country's roads are not paved like this. But this is development. Development. There was someone, you're right. So this is also development. Um, this is a great example of a coal burning factory that is fueling um, economic development. And I think most people would look at this and say, it's bad. Well, um, it's, it's awfully dirty. Um, there, you know, it's clearly a source of air pollution and also climate change. It's lots of carbon monoxide and probably lots of sulfur there as well. Um, and the people who work in this factory, many of them live here. You can kind of see these little, um, like, little compoundy things. And um, some of them live inside the compound as well. Now, when I go and interview these people, what do you think they say about the pollution? Just take a guess. I interviewed them and I said, you know, is this development, how do you feel about this living next to this factory? Um, just as long as they make money, probably they probably don't care. Probably as long as they make money, they don't care. They say their kids are sick and not happy. Um, why, are their why, why are their kids sick? Because of the pollution? Okay. So you think that they're saying, Another alternative. I don't okay. really know what they think. Mm. <laughs> what do you think? I, I, I don't know. Like, it could be either. I'm interested to hear what they really do think. What do people in this country think? You, if, if, if one of us were living next to one of these factories, or maybe some, some of us do, I don't know, or you know someone, do you think, what would you do? Would you write to Cargill or, or GM or, or your, your, your congressperson or? Course. You would write. Well, sort of like it's kind of like the whole what was it, issue with power. You know, people that were 
living at the power lines and starting it was causing cancer and different things like that. Like the US, people in the US are very don't want to get themselves caught in that type of situation. There's lots of movements saying that people are uh, lower income people are being pushed into living situations like that. There's big movement against that. Okay. So people in the US wouldn't stand for this. Yeah. Well, they would try not yeah. to, essentially. There there would be some grassroots movement to to m mitigate these kinds of bad situations. Okay. Where they had lived previously. So if this was an improvement, they might not complain. But if it is, you know, if they had lived somewhere better, then they probably would complain. Or if they are aware enough of the culture, I mean, if, I mean, I'm just talking about in the United States, say if they're immigrants or something, like they don't, if they don't know that there's the avenues to change, for change, and they might not complain. Okay. So, okay. Um, I'm going to turn the lights back on for a little bit. Um, there are lots of interesting topics that I haven't given the answer yet. I'm going to give the answer shortly. Um, you were just saying that if they, depends on their living situation before, if there was improvement, so that goes back to the sustainable development, if there was some type of development from what they had before, then maybe they don't think it's bad. How, how would these, so I don't want to keep flipping back and forth, but think back to the farmer earlier um, out in the field. How would those farmers decide, or uh, under what measures would those farmers decide whether their lives had improved or not? You Were you going to say something? Oh, okay. I'm just gonna, I mean, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that was like a big steel town for a long time. And um, people used to go into the city and they would bring two shirts because by the time, like mid-afternoon, your shirt would be dirty. So I mean, I don't. It's just it's just kind of like I don't know if people right there if they like because people in the United States live like that for a long time too. So. It was like that in, before. It's like that now. No, it's not like that now. But it, like people did live like that, and there was there was like no real objections to it for a long time. I think to gauge it, like you're saying formally about their house, or you know, it's, if you go from living in a sort of shack and then you have some sort of nicer house, even if it does have smudge on the walls from coal factories, it's still better than what you were doing, dealing with before, or for that, from that perspective. Right. So what are some of the, I, I want to push this question of what, what measures folks in this, not, I'm not applying our measures, you know, I, I can think of ways that I think I would be better off than I was last year, um, but how would these farmers decide whether they were better off? like food, you know, having more food or having like a roof over your head or having, well, yeah, and, and education probably wouldn't even come into it, sort of really basic things. Okay. So we're talking That's just basic, basic needs. needs. All right. Yeah, were you going to say something? Well, I was going <coughs> to say if the quality of their diet increases in terms of meat, in terms yeah. of whether their children are properly fed, in terms of whether they feel like they eat enough and in the right proportions as opposed to before. Or like even being able to go somewhere like McDonald's or something, just being, having that sort of an option might be. Okay, so having some, um, I'm hearing that it's diet is a big thing, is being able to choose what you want to eat um, and being able to choose to perhaps not expend your own energy to cook, but then to go someplace else as a treat, something from the West. The, having a little bit of excess or uh, something, you know, um, something outside of what, like you're saying, you know, a treat or being able to have that outside, like before where everything was so tight and then all of a sudden that would just be so exciting and extreme. What if, what if they make more money now, but they have to bring two shirts to work um, because the air is so bad and they have to wear a mask um, around their house? But now they have enough money to buy meat all the time, and uh, they have an, a slightly better house. Then, then how do we judge the cost benefit? Uh, I'm just throwing it out there. How do you decide? How do you decide whether you're better off now than you were four years ago? I assume most of you are seniors. No, okay, well, or graduate students. I mean, how do you decide if, if you were better off 
than when you were a first year student here. Other than that, oh, you're nearly graduating. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, what are the measures that you use to see whether your life has improved? Yeah. I think like um, as you get older, like you tend not to have to share your room as much. Oh, okay, so that's okay. You. So when you first move on campus, you have to have. Your Definitely usually have to have a roommate and you don't okay. have to eat dorm food as you get older. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Fewer dining halls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, dining hall is a bad thing because it's an institutional choice rather than your own personal preferences. And just, if you don't live in a dorm, like, food's generally better, I think. Okay. So, so a lot of this seems to be going back to diet for, for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about food here. Or maybe, this even, this, okay. maybe even this part, of, like, as far as class-wise, you get as you get older, like you don't have to take sort of required like freshman seminars or like silly things. Again, like that. So institutional choice. choices yeah. versus your own choices. Yeah. Okay. And I assume that the you, the classes that you choose are smaller. You get a little bit more attention. It's not like 300 people in a lecture hall. We, Sarah, were you gonna say something? I just said unless you wait till the last minute. I mean, I don't know. You may have to fulfill all your requirements at the end. <laughs> okay. All right, but but it seems like most 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 of our measurements are by uh, choice. That as long as we don't have to live with a roommate, we can choose to live with a roommate, but we don't have to. It's at least not someone that the school assigns for us. Uh, we don't have to eat the dining hall food, um, and. Essentially, we can choose to do our own thing. And I guess most of us living here don't have major health problems like emphysema from living next to a, a big plant or um, uh, hopefully no cases of cancer because of carcinogens in the water or um, radiated beef or <laughs> whatnot. Um, I, I, I asked this question, I, I want to kind of press it because you know, when I talk about my work, my, my research in this particular part of China, oftentimes people ask me, well, what do you think about the Three Gorges Dam? Because that is a big environmental issue. Um, it involves land use change. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Three Gorges Dam project, it's going to be the largest dam in the entire planet. And uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are being displaced because the river's going to be flooded. Um, and, and the central government said, I have to move lots of people, forced migration. And, and a lot of scientists and ar archaeologists are saying, well, there are uh, archaeological treasures that, that are going to be lost and uh, lots of land that's going to be flooded. Um, on the flip side of that, people are going to have electricity for the first time for a lot of these people. And, you know, I'm looking around in this room, you know, we've got all these fancy equipments, you know, I could use this slide projector or I could use this uh, overhead. Um, I mean, I've got access to all these different things that take, that require energy and require energy to produce this pen. And I don't even think, you know, I go in my office and I take this pen and I scribble as much as I want. I use these, these overheads and I don't really think well, where, where, where is this overhead made? How, what are the resources that it took to create this particular overhead? Um, and in other words, I'm saying, I think our lives are generally very easy. You know, we worry most about our roommates, which is a big issue, <laughs> and our food. And, you know, we worry about being somewhat up to date with, um, pop culture, whether it's music or clothes, styles, or something. You know, we, we want to feel like we're up on things. That's kind of what we're concerned about. But we don't worry about electricity, only occasionally in California, but you know, generally we don't. And so it's, I want to challenge you all, you know, depending on whatever you do after you graduate from Stanford, whether you become policymakers in international environmental uh, treaties, um, or whether you work for the EPA, or you know, whatever you end up doing, to, to really try to pull yourself out of your situation. Think of the farmer in China who doesn't have electricity, who has no choice, almost no choice, as to what he eats. I mean, basically, he's growing 
rice and vegetables and and beef and pork and poultry is really a luxury. So land use change from his perspective or their perspective is this is an improvement of our lives. We can now live in a slightly better house. We have electricity. We can choose to go to McDonald's. I mean, that is a really big thing in China. If you can go to McDonald's, it's almost like as though I've arrived. You know, I, I can now have a little, I know it's kind of frightening, but uh, you know, it's like they can have some access of Western lifestyle because they think Americans eat McDonald's all the time. Anyhow, going back to the answer, when I interviewed people, I was shocked. By and large, most people thought it was a good thing. It was a really good thing, and, I, and, and it made me think that I had now incorporated very Western ideas in what was good and what was bad in development. That I had forgotten that these people, this is a development for them. This is an improvement in their lives. And for them, it's sustainable in the sense that they now can feed and clothe their children in a way that they couldn't before. They were working out on the farms, eking out a living, literally working out in the farms 12 hours a day just to provide food. And now their son or daughter can work in the factory and not work 12 hours a day. And so they can, they can at least see that their generations are going to be um, are going to continue because people have food and they don't have to work until they're you know near death. But it was uh, I was surprised because I um, when you're there in some of these towns there is about a quarter of an inch of dust on everything. I mean it's so bad. You know you go back to your uh, car, your room, and you know you blow your nose and you look at the, the the tissue and it's just black. I mean it's kind of like the same thing if you live in London actually, but uh, it's it's just disgusting. But um, I'm also importing my value system there and saying, well, I prefer clean standards um, over these other uh, choices because I don't have to worry about it. Yeah. Do you, do you think that maybe like not this generation, but maybe the next generation's kids are gonna maybe have some concerns about that? I mean, well, like, it seems like once people have become like acclimated to these new things. Eventually, someone's going to be like, well, I don't want this dust anymore. Right, absolutely. And that's already happening in many parts of China. In Beijing, uh, in Guangzhou, uh, the government, people are getting sick. You know, the respiratory problems are increasing. It affects the economy. I mean, the bottom line for the government often is the economy. And if you're sick from respiratory problems, you can't work. Um, and people are saying, you know, we, we want to develop, but we don't want to de live with all of these environmental problems as well. Yeah. It strikes me as sort of the accelerated industrial revolution in terms of like the Victorian age was filthy. There were, mm -hmm. you know, right. everything was absolutely filthy during like the Victorian age in terms of London, in terms of Paris, in terms of even New York. And, you know, there is that stage that most developmental uh, industries go through where, you know, it's really, really dirty for a long time and then it mm -hmm. slowly starts cleaning up. And it almost seems like China is, I, mean, I don't want to say lucky, but they're accelerating through that very quickly. You know, they're getting through the extremely dirty phase and into the maybe we shouldn't do it this way. Maybe we should right. have yeah, hydropower, maybe we should have solar power faster. Mm -hmm. And so it's very bad now, but I feel like they already know. And so they're already working on making it better. That, that's absolutely right as well. I mean, there's. They've, they've been able to technologically leapfrog. I mean, they didn't have to go through all the different steps. I mean, it, one thing that's interesting is a lot of farmers have cell phones. <laughs> and um, it's very strange to see folks who don't have electricity in their house have a cell phone. And I mean, that is really one major technological leapfrog. Um, there's uh, also the large, I've seen some statistic as far as the number of Rolls Royces in the world is like a uh, absolute number of Rolls Royces. There are more Rolls Royces in China than in uh, like the United States. And absolute levels, that's not surprising because there are more than one billion people in China. But the per capita income is $600 a year. So it's a big leap you know, from making $600 a year to being able to buy a Rolls Royce. But clearly, they're developing extremely fast. Um, Time is almost up, but I just want to end on a couple of notes. Um, I want to go back to this earlier diagram that I had. If I can.
I can find it. Um, oh, yeah. Going back to these global environmental problems of, and we talked about air pollution. Someone mentioned air pollution, soil degradation, fisheries, agricultural resources being depleted um, or intensified. And the way that I've set this up, it looks kind of like this hierarchy of this is the bigger problem and then we can kind of dissect it. But one of the problems with this kind of diagram is it doesn't really show the inner linkages that clearly land use, well, land use affects methane emissions and carbon dioxide. But often, as we see in China, land use is an indicator of other things, of urbanization, of increases in wealth, of changes in diet. And then that clearly affects fossil, fossil fuel use. It affects agriculture. Definitely affects how many people can afford to buy refrigerators. And uh, so it's sometimes overwhelming to think of a particular problem or all of the problems as whole, as a whole, like, oh, all of these global environmental problems, there's so many of them. And I find it helpful, again, depending on whatever career you end up um, pursuing after you're done here, to really try to, it might be helpful to try to delineate the most linear path it may not be easy. It may not even be possible because clearly there is no linear path here. I mean, they're all interconnected. But as far as looking at a policy or looking at, um, at a particular problem, I guess I'm thinking back again to my particular issue in China. Is people, policymakers, when I meet with policymakers, they say, oh, we want development and we want um, people to get richer and um, we want industrialization. And it's hard to then tease out what is good, what is bad, what they can do to, to keep industrializing without having the environmental impacts. But I believe, that, I believe that sustainable development is possible. It's just we need to redefine what sustainable means. And we also re need to redefine what development means, particularly for these folks here. And for us who are analyzing these issues, that maybe development doesn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean our type of development or um, the rate of development that we have seen in this country. I mean, as a number of people have pointed out, you know, Pittsburgh air was very dirty. Victorian times, Industrial Revolution. Um, so we we as in people in this country and Western countries have had to go through this process, but at a very different rate, a different pace, different history. And so rather than pointing at a developing country and say, uh, you know, you've got all of these problems, sometimes it's helpful to just think of one thing. And for me, it's, it's urbanization and land use change and this very, very narrow, relatively narrow thing. And to think of how people's lives, I mean, rather than big policy things, rather than global climate change, because, you know, frankly, these farmers could give a nothing. <laughs> they don't care about global climate change. They care about feeding their families. And, and, and to kind of draw from these small cases and then to think back to how they fit into the big picture and how maybe policy levers, you know, what can the government or how, what can the government do or how can foreign direct investment, investment from overseas Chinese or overseas investors, whoever, how can they target their investments to um, development projects that will help the economy grow, but yet don't outsource, out, out, output the kind of pollution that we saw in that particular picture. I want to show one other um, last slide before I end off here. And it's one other image that you might find helpful when you think about China. <laughs> They're building a road here of the kind that we saw earlier. 
what is one of the biggest differences you see in this picture versus road construction in the U.S.? Sorry? There are no bulldozers. <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone's doing this by hand with, you know, 1.2, nearly 1.3 billion people. You can do a lot of things by hand. Um, you know, when we talk about development and, and improving people's lives, these are, the, these, these are the people, you know, this is kind of the scale at which development is happening. Um, to not forget that it's these little people. And then, one last thing, this is really the end. This is increasingly what parts of China look like now. Um, people want to live like they're from Orange County, California, or any suburban uh, city in the US. One last thing that's kind of interesting about this development is um, this development project was funded by an overseas Chinese from California. And um, there were some, a number of assumptions that were made about um, infrastructure development that existed in China. And after they built, they started building these homes, they realized that there was no sewage uh, system. When we take sewage systems for granted here, and in a lot of developing countries, India, China, sewage systems just don't exist. I mean, large scale sewage systems don't exist. So anyhow, this is the kind of the ending image that I want you to have of China, that, that essentially China is developing. Um, and this is what development for them looks like. It's not necessarily um, good from some people's perspectives, but certainly from, from many of their perspectives, it's not necessarily bad either. Whether it's sustainable, that's um, another topic altogether. Okay, thank you.